morning, Dan and Amy. Congressman Troy Nels of Texas was uh, critical of the Ashley Babbitt killing at the Capitol on January 6th. He uh, openly questioned why Lieutenant Byrd of the Capitol Police, why that case of his shooting and killing of Ashley Babbitt didn't go to a grand jury. And uh, now we find out that he is being investigated by Capitol Police. He went on Tucker Carlson's show yesterday to explain. Well, the claim is that they discovered one of my uh, office doors wide open on a, a Saturday afternoon. The so, officer right. entered my office and said, you know, to check to see if anybody was there that shouldn't be there and saw suspicious writings on my whiteboard, whereas where I draft my legislative proposals. A couple days later, I've got these secret agents, secret agents from the Capitol Police knocking on my office door, questioning my staff one of my staffers, as to the language on that board. Why was there body armor written on your board? Interrogating this, this staffer, asking him uh, questions related to a handwritten map of the Rayburn office building, which is an office building for, con for members of Congress, and the X on it. I mean, absolutely silly, absolutely ludicrous. Why were the Capitol Police inside my office investigating me? And I was under a criminal investigation. The chief of police, Manger, is, he's downplaying this, but I'm telling you, they're coming after anyone that has a dissenting point of view, anybody that doesn't agree with them. It happened to me, sir, I believe the NSA, it happened to you looking at your emails, text messages. Obama used the FBI to go after Donald Trump, Russia collusion, and we know how that turned out. So they're weaponizing these federal law enforcement agencies and, and intelligence agencies. And uh, some additional color on that. Any proliferating narratives the Biden administration deems false or misleading could qualify as a terrorism threat, according to a recent National Terrorism Advisory System bulletin released by the Department of Homeland Security. Really? So any misleading or false narrative could qualify as a terrorism threat. Does, so that does that include uh, disagreements about, uh, say, COVID policy uh, or understandings of the importance of vaccinations and the like? Does it include uh, anything that would um, uh, run afoul of the January 6th commission's narrative on January 6th? statements they've made to this point, members of that commission have made to this point, a report they will offer at the end of their their uh, tenure to the extent that there is an end to the tenure. For more on all this, we're pleased to be joined by Amy Ziegart. She's a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and a professor of political science and past co-director of Stanford Center for International Security and Cooperation. Her new book, Spies, Lies, and Algorithms, The History and Future of American Intelligence. Uh, Professor Ziegert, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Well, thanks so much for having me on. Uh, what about um, Congressman uh, Nels and this uh, investigation based on, you know, f finding uh, body armor uh, scrawled on his whiteboard where, you know, he well, talks to staff about legislation and, and so on and so forth? Uh, this uh, January 6th um, investigation, you know, I guess the question is, where are the lines drawn by law enforcement and consultation with intelligence agencies between investigation and witch hunt? Great question. You know, I don't know the details of, of the investigation. I think, you know, most of us don't know the details of the investigation yet, so I don't want to be premature. But I think it's fair to say that, you know, the Capitol Police are uh, struggling, right? We know that sort of poorly uh, coordinated and poorly informed and poorly outfitted for January 6th. And this question of who should investigate and when and how needs to be coordinated with our law enforcement agencies uh, very carefully, because as, as you point out in the opening, it, there's a fine line between investigation uh, and free speech. And I think we're, we're, we're seeing that, you know, that challenge play out in real time. And and to his, I mean, his assertion that law enforcement and intelligence are being weaponized, I mean, this is not a new 
uh, accusation directed at the alphabet soup of law enforcement and intelligence agencies at the federal level. Is that charge? Does that have legitimacy, given some of the examples he provided, including Tucker Carl NSA spying on Tucker Carlson, and including uh, you know, so Russian collusion, including so many of the most recent escapades of the Department of Justice, of of uh, CIA, of FBI? Well, I think we have to be careful about what agencies we're talking about, right? There are 18 different intelligence agencies of our U.S. government. And, and the word spying, the NSA spying on individual American citizens, that's a very serious charge. And what's been publicly reported and to the extent that we know, the National Security Agency has lots of laws, lots of oversight, that prevent it from unauthorized spying on American citizens. Now, does that mean that uh, that, that communications don't get uh, picked up if there's a if there's a, uh, sort of a, a a predicate? No, but there are very carefully crafted laws that dictate the confines of what our intelligence agencies can do. So but I if, think we need to be really careful about that. But but if they're if they're operating within the constraints of those laws, then why does former uh, department uh, why does a former director of national intelligence Jim Clapper have to lie to Congress about their data collection? Well, I think you know it's an interesting and I write about this in the book. That was an interesting moment, right? So Director Clapper was asked about and you're absolutely right, he was asked about uh, collection of millions of records on American citizens. And the answer was, yes, the NSA was collecting metadata, which is the phone records, not the content of your calls, right, but the the time and uh, of the call. Uh, and so Clapper said no when the answer was yes. Now, why did he do that? There's a big debate about why he said it. He was in an unclassified hearing, so he couldn't reveal a classified program. Uh, but uh, but uh, he ended up stepping on his toes, and it was an unforced error on Director Clapper's part. The NSA should have been much more forthcoming about what it was doing. So you don't think he just flat out lied? I think he said, and it did not help him, that it was the least untruthful answer he could give. So I think <laughs> wow. he was caught in a pretty tough spot because he didn't want to reveal classified information. But he could have said that. People, he could have said that. Well, except that when you say that you can't reveal classified information, in fact, you are revealing something in the hearing. <laughs> Look, I don't want to get in a position of defending Director yeah, Clapper. Yeah, I yeah, think he I would you. agree that it, was a, that it was not a good moment for him. But so, it is to say that these are pretty complicated issues. Well, is it further complicated and confused uh, and creating skepticism and lack of trust? It, it may be the, the baseline is something that you just said. 18 different agencies. Do we have too many agencies that are and, and, and too little oversight and too little collaboration, you know, left hand, right hand stuff going on? We do. And Dan, you've put your finger on a really important issue, which is why don't more people trust these intelligence agencies? There are a lot of reasons why that is. But part of it is they are too secret when they don't need to be. Right. So they they hide behind secrecy often too much when, in fact, if they'd be more forthcoming about what they're doing, they'd have greater trust of the American people. And former NSA director Mike Hayden has written about this, saying specifically about NSA programs, it was a political mistake not to talk about them earlier. They would have gotten more of the support of the American people had they been more forthcoming. And, uh, you know, the issues with the FISA court that has long been uh, basically a rubber stamp for law enforcement and in the aftermath of the Russian collusion fiasco where there were misrepresentations made by by the FBI to the FISA uh, judges. Um, this is something that the uh, inspector general for the Department of Justice concluded. Um, and Christopher Ray came in and we're going to do all sorts of reforms. So there's never material misrepresentations made again and so on and so forth. Has has anything fundamentally changed that would prevent uh, the uh, the episode that we went through with Russian collusion uh, from occurring again? Well, I think what we did see with the, the subsequent investigation was that the FBI was sloppy, to put it mildly. And the FBI needs to improve uh, a variety of, of, of activities that it does. And, and you put your finger on a big one. So I'd like to think that there's been an improvement. But it's hard to know from the outside looking in uh, how well the Bureau is doing. You know, FBI problems go back a long way with respect to intelligence. The FBI failed uh, to prevent 9-11. Other intelligence agencies did, too. But when I took a close look at 9-11 and how the FBI failed to adapt, 
I found widespread widespread problems throughout the Bureau, misunderstanding the law, misunderstanding regulations, not being able to share information even between different field offices of the FBI. So FBI problems are nothing new. Well, do you yeah, think they it, learned anything from that? I think it's gotten better, but that's a pretty low bar, right, if you're talking yeah. about I found that the CIA and the FBI missed 23 different opportunities to penetrate the 9-11 plot mm. in the weeks and months before that attack. So have they gotten better? Yes, but the FBI has a long way to go. That's and it's not just what they don't do or what they don't prevent. It's also what they do. Uh, and there have been you know, a number of cases where they have gotten it horrifically wrong. Uh, I mean, Clint Eastwood made a movie about one of them, Richard Jewell, and the, the bombing uh, at the Olympics in Atlanta. And, and, and of course, in, in the Larry Nassar case, I know that's not necessarily an intelligence case, but the FBI mishandled that investigation, too, they admit. I mean, it just doesn't inspire a lot of confidence with respect to anything these agencies are doing. Well, and I think as we see now playing out in the Beijing Olympics, you know, the burner phone Olympics, um, that the threat environment is a really serious one. And we absolutely have to have these agencies operating effectively. You know, the FBI director just a a week or so ago talked about how they're opening a new China-related investigation twice. There's um, too many people coloring outside the lines. Is it, and, and, you know, and and everything that we did post 9-11 to augment the uh, state's intelligence capacity and law enforcement capacity with things like the Patriot Act. Is it time uh, two decades later to do a reassessment and think about streamlining intelligence agencies, uh, perhaps other structural reforms? Well, I think we have two problems at the same time. One is that we have poor coordination across our agencies. But the second problem is we actually are missing one agency that we need and don't have, and it's a core capability that I think is getting short-sighted, and that is an agency that's dedicated to open-source intelligence or publicly available information. You know, these days, uh, secret agencies always favor secrets, but the, the real insight today is coming from things that you and I can get with our cell phones and with our Internet connections, commercial satellite imagery and the like. And so that's the name of the game in the future is really harnessing insight from publicly available information with, of course, protections on civil liberties uh, and the collection against Americans on American soil. But we don't have an agency dedicated to doing that and doing it well. What about uh, the problem that every government agency has, and that's mission creep, and perhaps uh, this uh, this DH memo about uh, misleading narratives is an example of it. The uh, Merrick Garland uh, memo uh, tasking the FBI to be monitoring school boards for unruly parents, perhaps, is another example. Mission creep is always a challenge. And I think if we look broadly across our intelligence agencies, the one area of mission creep that most concerns me is we've gotten really good at coordinating intelligence for counterterrorism operations. What does that mean? It means the CIA is operating much more closely with the military. And there's some good news there. We had the ISIS takedown uh, just a week ago. But the bad news is the more the CIA is helping hunters, which is what the military is supposed to do, the less it can focus on gathering intelligence to deal with longer-term, over-the-horizon threats. So I worry about the mission creep after 9-11 really hamstringing uh, the CIA's ability to prevent strategic surprise, which is what it's supposed to do. She is Amy Ziegart, senior fellow at the Hoover Institution, professor of political science and past co-director of Stanford Center for International Security and Cooperation. Her new book, Spies, Lies, and Algorithms, The History and Future of American Intelligence. Professor Ziegart, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. All right. Thank you. And she joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. It's news, opinion, insight. This is Chicago's Morning Answer on AM560, The Answer. Spills happen every day in your workplace, anywhere gasoline, diesel, machine, crude, or cooking oils are used. These spills not only disrupt workflow production, but are hazardous to employees and the public. You need a team that can come in and clean up that spill and get your crew back to work and remove the ugly, unsightly stains. You need Cabino Environmental Field Services, an environmental response team to the rescue. Using sustainable, all-natural green products, they mitigate the spills and extract the stain from the pavement. The only byproduct is the used oil.